Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Simply Bitcoin IRL. Today, we have a very, very special guest. Uh, I've been looking forward to this episode for a very long time. And of course, we have uh, one. Everyone always gets a, a little bit embarrassed when I call them a legendary Bitcoiner. But in my book, he's a legendary, legendary Bitcoiner. And of course, I'm talking about Daniel Prince. He is the host of the Once Bidden podcast, which is an absolutely legendary podcast in the Bitcoin space. Before we jump into the show, I do want to give a very quick shout out to the Bitcoin company that makes this show possible. Of course, I'm talking about Bitcoin Well. Bitcoin Well is the first Bitcoin on-ramp in the United States that is self-custody by default. That's right. You can't buy Bitcoin on Bitcoin Well unless you're going to take self-custody. It's a publicly traded company coming out of Canada, which recently expanded to all 50 states on the mission to make self-custody the standard. So guys, check out bitcoinwell.com today. All right, everybody, no more delay. Let me bring up Daniel on stage. Daniel, great to see you. We just crossed paths in Meet Space in Portugal, in Madeira. Uh, what an absolutely amazing conference. And it was great to actually meet you for the first time. Yeah, it was amazing, mate. Really amazing and um, incredible event such a special place lots of emotion a lot of tears at that one that was amazing you know even jeff got up there and delivered his keynote and got very emotional at the end of it and uh the um the whole vibe that it was just a, a huge ball of fun positive bitcoin energy it was great to see everybody there yeah, and I, 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 yeah, no, I completely agree. It was, uh, it was, it was very special. It was, it was a very, it was a very special, uh, it was a very, very special event. Uh, we were talking a little bit about it backstage, about it being open air, it being in the stadium. Uh, Sailor's uh, speech was was a little bit different. Uh, it was, you know, he 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 addressed it. You know, he he said it even the very beginning of the conversation. I think you actually even introduced him, didn't you? I did, yeah. You did introduce him. How was that? We got the football chant going. That was great. Yeah, sailor, no, sailor. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I figured, well, we're in a football stadium, and I know, uh, I know, I you know, I got a lot of North American friends, and one of the one of the things that comes up all the time is like, you crazy bastards over in Europe, all jumping up and down, linking arms, singing and chanting in the stadium. What's that all about? Uh, so I thought it'd be nice to welcome. You know the, those guys from across the pond, and get a, a little football chant going in the uh, in the stands there. And um, yeah, the, the, the thought crossed my mind as he was coming out on stage, and I think he appreciated it. So it was it was good fun. But yeah, it great. And again, uh, a great a great speech. Yeah, a hundred percent. And it was it was a it was it was a great conference. Very special, uh, beautiful islands. Little you know, I, I highly suggest people make the pilgrimage next year. And I'm pretty sure Andre and co are going to be throwing it again because of just how successful this one was. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was great. It was great to see you. Like I said, uh, so Daniel, look, a lot of things have happened. Uh, I think, uh, you and I have both been making Bitcoin content for quite a while. And I think what I'm seeing is basically Bitcoin maturing. It's a teenager, right? Uh, you know, it's being, uh, legitimate legitimized in the eyes of the traditional financial world. Uh, you know, it's come a long way and in a way it's changed a little bit, you know, and even from a price standpoint, currently it's sitting at 70,000 US dollars. That's more than the average, you know, salary of an American right right now. And I'm pretty sure that's the average that more than the average salary of someone in Europe as well. So in a way it's 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 uh, of course, you know, it is divisible. You know, there's eight decimal places and all that stuff. And in a way it's getting out priced. It's now for the big guys. Uh, so what's your take on that? Like where, where, where are we in Bitcoin's history uh, from your perspective, especially someone who's been doing this for quite a long time? Yeah, I think about it a lot about like the, um, the ETFs. Is it good for Bitcoin? Is it bad for Bitcoin? That's a classic debate. Um, the, but the crux of the matter is, it was going to happen. It was going to happen anyway. That the fact it took them 15 years to create these ETFs and for Wall Street to get involved uh, astounds me. Absolutely astounds me that it's taken them this long. So when I think about that, and I'm, you know, I just wonder what's next now. Like, uh, you know, to your point, is that game over for the little guys that want to get in? 
I don't think so. There are so many great apps now, great, um, well, Bitcoin Well that you're talking about um, who, who sponsor this show. Over here, we have uh, companies such as Relay who sponsor my show uh, that make it very easy for you to download an app and get stack and sats uh, in a self-custodial manner as well. Um, so maybe, maybe this just speeds things up because now it's in the news. It's in front of everybody and people are going to start coming to to us, like not me and you personally, but the plebs as a whole that have been talking about Bitcoin for the last two, three, five, eight years, however long it's going to be. And they're going to be asking you, you know, what's the best way for me to uh, get some Bitcoin? Where do I go? What's the best practice? So we got our work cut out ahead of us to make sure that the, uh, the message is strong and we can just keep pushing the education. And that's why I say pretty much on every show, it's like if you've got something to offer and you do as a bitcoin pleb uh get to a meetup go and meet people at a conference get in front of other bitcoiners and figure out the project that is going to set you alight and that could be your own podcast your own youtube channel your own educational uh, materials a book an article whatever we need all hands on deck it feels like there's too much bitcoin content but there just isn't and uh you and I have seen that change over the, the last uh, five to seven years. Uh, I remember scrabbling around trying to find absolutely whatever I could. Now I can just get over to Bitcoin Audible and guys there reading me absolutely everything that's ever been written about Bitcoin and he still can't keep up. Uh, but we do need more, uh, plenty more. Yeah, 100%. And uh, uh, I, I've heard that before and I agree with it myself as well. And I kind of tied in with the cultural aspect right because at, at the end of the day we're really we're, we're trying to over we're trying to win over the hearts and minds of people and in a way it's you know maybe it sounds a little bit hyperbolic but i believe it this is kind of information warfare in, in a way right and what what better way to combat uh you know the other side but to make more content right to kind of drown out their content um, even though, I mean, their content's absolutely terrible. You have them posting on Twitter, basically saying Bitcoin's going to die. You know, there's no inflation, all these, you know, all these, you know, funny, uh, funny stuff. And you're just like, wow, these people are so terrible. They're starting to make TikTok videos now, which I find absolutely hilarious. But yeah, there can never be too much content. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely changed tremendously from where it was a couple of years ago. It, it, it was in its infancy in 2019 2020 there was crypto channels but there wasn't really bitcoin only bitcoin only really started to flourish like in the last couple of years or so uh but i think making content for a lot of people is daunting uh what would you recommend to them because i think a lot of people come into this like wow it's a podcast you have to get a microphone the camera you have to put myself on the internet um if you were to start from zero again uh, what lessons have you learned that if you can go back in time, you would, uh, tell your previous self? Yeah, I'd do exactly the same again. I had a laptop and I had a pair of earphones, you know, just, just, that's it. That was my microphone. That's how I started the podcast. My barrier to entry was zero. And that's what, when I came to that realization, I, God damn, that's when I realized how much I'd been procrastinating. And that was kind of a kick in the balls. It's like, well, you know, step up, man. Like, What are you doing? You've been procrastinating about starting a podcast for months. I, I've been thinking for months that I need to do something uh, in this space. Uh, and it sounds a little bit cliche, but to give something back, right? But that's exactly what I wanted to do. That's what I felt. And I wanted to, uh, and I didn't have a following. I had like 1,300 followers on Twitter. And that was only because people had started um, following me about my book and about homeschooling and world schooling and that kind of stuff. So to completely switch the message on those people was, uh, you know, a total 180. Um, but yeah, any, anybody can start and, you know, it doesn't have, you. of course, you don't even have to put yourself on uh, the video either. You can just do a pure audio podcast under a pseudonym as well. And if it sucks, who the fuck's ever going to know? It doesn't matter. It, you know, it wasn't you. Um, most podcasts, I think, what's the... What's the stat? Most podcasts never get beyond 10 episodes or something. Um, really? Yeah, something like that. I can't remember where I heard or, or read that. But, uh, you know, there's your metric. And if you've got a Zoom account, which most people do, 
21 episodes in the private chat. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then, um, yeah, you've got, uh, you, you've got the opportunity just to have conversations with people. And when you reach out on, on Twitter, just in people's DMs, you'd be shocked at the amount of people that just turn around and say, yeah, let's go. I'll support your effort and um, whatever you need. Uh, and it doesn't have to be a podcast. It could be writing uh, an article that, you know, that just get an article out there and publish it and or offer that article up to an upcoming conference or something and just say, listen, this is something I'd like to, maybe they're putting a program together, a little magazine or whatever. Or maybe they want you to come and talk about it on stage. Then you really get into uh, imposter syndrome <laughs> territory. Uh, then Now that's something different, but that all just, you know, that comes with just putting one foot in front of another, putting yourself out there and, um, you know, being willing to, to step up and you know, give back to the community. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I think it, you also have to love it, right? Because if you don't love it, you know, there's going to be some days where you inevitably r r come to this kind of conclusion mentally where you're like, why am I doing this? Right. And if you love it, then you're going to do it anyways, because you actually love and you feel passionate about what you do. So I think, you know, that's one of the key aspects as well. Now, I kind of want to loop back a little bit to what we were talking on, about. At the beginning. On that point, you know, I have been doing this for four years and I love it because yeah. I get to hang out like that. I'm working right now, sitting here having a chat with you about Bitcoin and, and I get to connect with plebs from all over the world and each podcast can last between an hour and two hours. Yes, a lot goes into, you know, scheduling and writing show notes and a little bit of editing if you need to, uploading to YouTube and all the other but you learn that as you go and that gets streamlined and you can figure that out. Uh, and plebs again, will step up and help you. You know, the intro and the outro music to me was gifted to me from a Bitcoin pleb that just wanted to help. And, um, you know, it all came together very organically. Uh, but yeah, you look, you get to hang with Bitcoiners and there's no better thing to be doing. And it does not feel like a minute of work, not one day. 100%. I 100% agree with you. Uh, yeah, it's because, you know, like you said, it's like having a conversation and that is the work, right? Which is, you know, it's, 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 it's a little, it's a bit surreal, a lot of work that goes into it, especially if you want to monetize it, right? It's definitely, you know, yeah, uh, a long and tumultuous journey, I would say. Uh, but if you're able to overcome, and I think a lot of people are able to come overcome because they feel passionate about it, because it doesn't feel like work, if they keep if they keep chipping at it, eventually they'll break through. So, anyways, I I wanted to double back to what you were saying in, in the very very beginning, where we were talking about Bitcoin maturing, Bitcoin growing up, Bitcoin's a teenager. You have this you know crazy institutional demand um, from you know from these large asset managers, and it looks like they're just gobbling up <laughs> hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin, and they are right in, in a matter of months. So my question to you, to you, Daniel, you know, are we late to Bitcoin? If someone came up to you today and they said, Daniel, look, this thing has a 70 K. I feel like I've missed the boat. You know, I, I, I didn't buy a 10,000 and I didn't buy a thousand. I didn't buy it a hundred. Uh, I feel late. Right. So what would your response to that person be? Yeah, we all know that as Bitcoiners, you know, every day is a good day to buy Bitcoin. Right. And that's the, that's the key. And for those people that are going to come up to you and, and ask you about that, and they're going to be uh, down in the dumps. I can't believe it's at 70,000. You know, I should have listened to you years ago. Uh, we've all been through those conversations. Um, getting them comfortable with the fact that, no, we're still so early. Like, if this is going to be money for the next thousands of years, we're only 15 years in, right? It, it, it's a blip on like that, that timeline. Uh, so we're still so early and anything that anybody can do right now to start stacking some sats and to start learning, right? That's the thing. That's the key thing. The stacking must go in tandem with the education and that you, you must be stacking and reading or listening or watching YouTube videos at the same time. Those journeys start together because that's how you build the conviction. If you're just stacking and checking the price, you know, you're going to fall into the trap of getting shaken out when that price starts falling. And it can be manipulated a lot easier now because 
of what's going to happen with these what do we have 11 spot etfs now in the uh, in the us they're going to start playing games against each other that's just how wall street works and they're going to start putting out fud and headlines that are going to created a price of Bitcoin to shake you out of yours so they can keep scooping them up on the exchanges. Now, everybody must remember, especially if you're new, there's only a finite amount of this Bitcoin. So stack them, take self-custody, make sure you are up to speed on what that even means. If you don't know what self-custody means, there's lesson number one. Just watch some YouTube BTC sessions videos and, you know, or, or, or listen to some of... Um, the, uh, the other educational Bitcoin-only podcasts out there. Uh, there is so much, so many guides now, so many how-tos that you can be up to speed so quickly and comfortable with the, the asset that you are investing in uh, rather, <laughs> rather than way back in the day, like as soon as a negative headline came out, that, that price would bottom out and so many people would just panic because they didn't have the resources on hand to have built that conviction over the investment in which they were making. So it, it is different now. It is a better investment landscape. Uh, I would say to new people coming in, just stick with it for at least a year of cons you know constant stacking and constant reading and educating yourself. And you'll be in a, you'll be in a complete... <laughs> You'll be a completely different person in 12 months time, let alone in a better place, uh, you know, not just physically, mentally, but fiscally as well. Yeah, so hold on. You you buried the lead there because it's really, really important what you just said. Right. You don't change Bitcoin. Bitcoin changes you. Yeah. And I think as Bitcoiners, you fundamentally understand that the longer you stay in Bitcoin, the longer you have Bitcoin in cold storage, it completely changes your mindset. One hundred percent. I think makes you happier, makes you more confident, makes you hopeful about the future in a way. So I really want to focus on that a little bit because you, you mentioned it, but that can't be overstated. And that's something that I think a lot of people that just see Bitcoin as an investment and not a, for lack of a better word, a, 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 a spiritual, a financial revolution, really. Um, mm -hmm. I think they're missing half the picture in its entirety. So could you talk a little bit about that? Oh man, this is where it all gets a little bit woo-woo on us, right? And uh, I, it, and I can't believe how it's changed me. And the, the effect, and everybody has this effect. Everybody, if you go to a Bitcoin meetup and if you talk to anyone that's been in Bitcoin for longer than a year or so, they would have had this change. Um, yeah, financial revolution. I, I, I think more of it as a human, evolution i think as humans were evolving onto you know the soundest uh, form of money that has ever been discovered and the like the the knock-on effects the societal effect, uh, effects of that um the psychological effects the the philosophical effects of that are so profound that none of us have managed to really put it into exact words and anybody that hasn't listened to uh, the bitcoin rapid fire podcast john vallis has been down so many philosophical rabbit holes with so many different people and it's really uh so enlightening when you listen to other people's journeys uh and you know you can learn from them and learn from their past mistakes but um i one of my earlier episodes i did a uh, a podcast with uh, safe safe dino moose who wrote the bitcoin standard and we were going through that book and he wanted to for that interview really focus in on uh, low time preference and how Bitcoin changes that, you know, you, you from a high time preference individual to a low time preference individual, which basically means when you're high time preference in your fiat role, you are, you're doing your nine to five job, you're five days a week, and then you're doing your second hand, uh, your, your second uh, job on the side, side hustle, whatever it is, just to keep up, right? And you you can't, ever seem to get off that hamster wheel because you are chasing a money that is infinitely it was designed darkly designed to lose purchasing power over time and you can never get your head above water so that affects every single economic decision that you make every single second of the day and then when you turn that on its head because you are saving your time now and your energy and your your finances into a, a sound money and 
that is actually designed to go up in purchasing power that turns your head upside down and starts changing slowly uh, your economic decision making um, maybe that might start monthly then weekly then daily then nico you'd know this every second of every day your economic decision making has been completely u-turned and um that is incredible so i would if nobody's read that book or if you have the book on your shelf go back and reread that about the time preference because for him he still believes that is one of the most critical parts of of bitcoin and and how that has completely changed our behavior as as a community over time a hundred percent and and it, it changes your it you know i had ck uh on simply bitcoin irl many many months ago and he the way that he phrases it is essentially that it changes your operating system you know and i think that if you are on a fiat standard you have a different perspective on the world what money is you have low time preference because whether you're aware of it or not, the money is incentivizing you to spend, right? Because I think on, on an innate level, I think people inherently know something is broken. I think I think they inherently know it. I think they're seeking a political solution to it, uh, which is, I think, why politics is so divisive nowadays. Uh, but they're, they're not really, a, a, uh, uh, you know, they're not really awakened. They're not really aware of that it's, it's the money, it's the money that's broken. Right. Um, I was making a joke the other day on Twitter and I was basically like, look guys, we have the game plan. We know how to get a libertarian candidate elected. All we need is a hundred percent inflation <laughs> and we get the first libertarian candidate election uh, elected in Argentina. But you know, it's interesting to me that it, people really, it, unfortunately, they, it's almost as if they need to feel some type of pain. Something needs to break for them to ask the very fundamental question of what is money? Um, because if not, like if, if the inflation rate is something that Jeff Booth has said, if the inflation rate is one or two or three percent, it's not enough for people to realize that they're being stolen from, really. So, yeah, it's 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 a very, very interesting phenomenon. And you know, kind of going back to what you were saying about in the beginning about more people making content. This is why it's so important because the more people make content, the more people awaken to this reality of, holy cow, you know, we can have a better future. You know, we can hope for a better future. It doesn't matter where you are on the economic scale. If you earn and save in Bitcoin, you know, you actually have a future where right now, it's something absurd. You know, they expect you to work from 18 years old to 65. At 65, you could potentially retire if you reach this, you know, absurd amount of money, right? So it, it clearly the system's broken. And I, I think Bitcoiners actually have the solution. I think the politicians are just, are just a, a distraction, to put it nicely, I would say. And I think you're right. Everybody knows there's something wrong because we, you know, we, we are human beings, right? We're problem solving machines. We have these incredible operating systems to use that analogy. We, we, these, these brains of ours are unbelievable. Um, we have been coerced into believing that, yes, you've got to, I mean, look at the way society sets us up, right? You, you're taken away from your family from very young age now. Um, in, in some cases, like, you know, young mothers are giving babies over to au pairs at the age of three months or something because their maternity leaves over and they've got to get back to their career because that's the only way that they can afford to bring up kids and keep shelter over their heads. Otherwise, you're giving them up at like three, four or five years of age to go to the local state school. Or if you're going to overpay for the, the same kind of education, you're going to send them into a, a private school. And then that's 12 to 15 years. So we, we, we lock our kids up for the first 15, maybe 20 years of their lives and in schools right? In small little rooms with 30 strangers. And then we lock our 20 to 65 year olds up in cubicles. And then we lock our 65 year olds up to, to death in, you know, old people's homes. That is so freaking fucked up when you think about how society has been ordered in such a manner and how did we get there and why, why, why do we chase after this money, this fiat currency, Fiat being Latin for by decree. So you're ordered 
to use that money, well, no, currency, as a medium of exchange to express value to each other in uh, economic transactions throughout your whole life. You are using a currency of a, uh, a unit of account that is forced upon you and is designed to lose purchasing power. You innately know that's wrong. All of us, every single person, something, your subconscious, something deep inside of you, something in your soul is screaming at you. This is not right. So when something like Bitcoin comes along and we see it for what it is, you cannot unsee it and you cannot help but feel that hope for the future. And you cannot help but want to spread the word to free these other people around you because it's when, when we're trying to educate people about Bitcoin, it's not to pump our bags. It's not because, oh, if you buy some, that's going to increase the purchasing power of mine because against what? Against the US dollar or euro or a pound that none of us ever care about or want to use ever again? No, for us, the, the pure metric here is the the number of people that join the network goes up every single day every day that is ngu technology right there number go up of, every, of people joining the network and that is the only thing that we should be focused on and when people start joining that that changes their way of thinking that changes society and that starts giving people hope and we can start connecting again as a species as we should be and just moving away from that other system that is so crippling and you know like it, it's just so heavy you can't do anything under it it's so dark and um yeah I, I i think i went off on a tangent but if you got anything else there that you want to bring me back to what we were talking about then yeah fire it at me no i mean it's such a it's such a rabbit hole in terms of you know what uh how bitcoin changes your outlook on the human condition that like i feel like we can talk for another five hours on that specific subject matter but there was a there was something that you brought up which i know is something that you feel very passionate about and it's the idea of uh schooling right so uh, the current schooling system is set up right here i think all over the world and in the states too right you kind of outsource the education of your kids at a very uh, vulnerable age, right? And then people get confused when they get back home and they hate you all of a sudden. And, you know, it's not really that confusing. It's, you know, like you're sending them into an environment where uh, they might be teaching I'm doing this. I'm putting this very nicely and I'm aware that we're on YouTube, um, but you know, they're putting you in an environment where they might be teaching your kids something that you might not agree with on a fissile, uh, fissile, uh, 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 oh my God, I can't say the word. It's a hard word. It's philosophical level. I appreciate it, Daniel. Thank you. English is my second language. Um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's in, in a way it's, it's kind of absurd you know, but we've been conditioned for this to be the norm, just like we've been conditioned for it to be the norm to use, you know, paper money with old men on the faces of it. And then there's a pyramid with an eye on the top of it and just think like this is normal. Money has to lose purchasing power. We've been kind of conditioned for this system. I think it's a product of the industrial age and, you know, in the early uh, 20th century. And, you know, it's still here. Right. But I, I think the internet in a way has made this uh this way of education uh, a little bit obsolete you could say and i think it's starting to show its cracks um not so much in in the system itself but what what the outcome of that system is it's almost as if that system is not necessarily a system of education and this is going to be very to be intense but i'm going to say it anyways it's almost as if that system is a system of indoctrination Right. So uh, I want to get your take on that, Daniel. Indoctrination across the nation, mate. That's exactly what it is. Um, so I wrote a, a chapter in uh, a book that's coming out pretty soon. It's called Parallel. Um, I had a copy around here somewhere. Brian DeMint uh, is his second book, but he invited myself and Knut von Holm to um, add a chapter to it, which I, I gladly did. And he, he wanted me to talk about like, um, the Bitcoin social layer and, and education. So yeah, I just, I want people to, to understand the true nature 
of the education system, especially in America, uh, because it's from there that it gets really pushed abroad, you know, through um, all kinds of different propaganda methods, like movies being one of them. When when we were growing up watching movies coming out of Hollywood and uh, we'd see the schools over there, you'd be like, wow, this is amazing. If only our school was like, you know, that. And um, it, it has shaped a lot of um, the global education system around the world. And they picked up from, you know, Europe, uh, the, the main countries at that point were France, uh, England, and Germany uh, that were really shaping uh, the world with um, their their resources, uh, especially with coal. So they had energy in abundance and they had um, the Industrial Revolution was uh, really picking up steam. So yes, they did need uh, to fashion people in a certain manner to um, work in the factories or be, you know, in the military. That was what that was the might of these countries that was how uh, empires were being built and it was in the mid 1800s that a guy called horace mann out of the us uh he come across to germany to prussia specifically which was a, um, a separate state in northern germany to study their education system and this is where i started um uh, grabbing quotes from so what what happened uh it, why was Prussia running such a education system in the first place? And it was after the Battle of Jena, um, which was fourth of October, fourth uh, of October, eighteen o six, when Napoleon's army defeated the Prussian army in the Battle of Jena. This victory solidified Napoleon as a military genius, led to the occupation of Berlin, the fall of the Prussian military, and fanned the flames of Napoleon's vision of a unified, controlled Europe under French rule. So there was a guy there in Jena at the time by the name of Gottlieb Fichte. Fichte. Um, I, I'm sorry, all German listeners, if I'm uh, brutally uh, mispronouncing that. And uh, he saw this. Uh, he he saw the whole Prussian army just basically um, rolled over and like this great huge state that was just gone in front of his eyes. And he became very critical of the state of Prussia. And in 1807, he started delivering lectures uh, addressed, um, titled, excuse me, Addresses to the German Nation. And he started um, releasing these at University of Berlin, outlining his belief that the education system needed further reformation. And it was all pretty hard at the time. But some of the quotes, and this is what I was building up to, I want to get you up to speed where his mind was at when this was being formed in the early 1800s. The schools must fashion the person and fashion him in such a way that he simply cannot will. Otherwise, then what you wish him to will. That's one quote. It is essential that from the very beginning, the pupil should be continuously and completely under the influence of this education and should be separated altogether from the community and kept from all contact with it. I mean, like this is the, the, the this is what these people were thinking of what to do with children to rebuild a nation. And so that's what Horace Mann went over to study. Now, if you read John Taylor Gatto's book, The Underground History of the American Education System, he blows the lid off all of this kind of stuff. And he actually had a letter from Mann's wife, I can't remember who she wrote it to, uh, sent back saying that the trip has basically been a disaster. We've toured empty classroom after empty classroom. Because the, <laughs> the brainiacs went to visit the schooling system during like the Easter or summer holidays, I can't remember. So they hadn't met any teachers, let alone a student. But he came back and wrote up this whole document on why we as America need to switch our focus to forming an education system based on the Prussian model. And he kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And in the end, he did manage to get that through. And that is what started happening towards the late uh, the 1890s. But then we come into the early 1900s. And I'm sure many of the listeners are aware of, you know, the secret meetings that take place where policies get decided. One such meeting did take place in 1910 on the island of, uh, on Jacket Island, where uh, the Federal Reserve Act was uh, conjured up and thought up by uh, these uh, amazing think tanks. And then the dog and pony show was taken back to America and Congress, and they finally got the Federal Reserve Act through in 1913. Now, these, 
that was a playbook that already already been played uh, to capture the education system. The General Education Board was formed in 1902. And the way they did that was a secret meeting in an undisclosed location hosted by uh, John D. Rockefeller Jr. to decide on how we should move forward and educate people to, um, to what they needed, to, to how we could shape society for the betterment of society. The, uh, the General Education Board was formed in late 1902, early 1903, with a million dollars uh, by John D. Rockefeller Sr., who attended the second meeting. And then they hired a guy called uh, Frederick T. Gates, I think, um, to oversee the whole thing. And, of course, this is where the idea of uh, philanthropy comes in when you are cutting a check to uh, education, like uh, universities or whatever, um, that that would be tax free. You know, this is how that kind of whole thing started off. But um, there's a there's a, the, the philosophy. Let me find this um, because they wrote out the. Uh, here we go. This is um, the under. You're right. Okay. Right. This is the uh, the philosophy that the philosophy of the General Education Board. And it was uh, a paper delivered, uh, it's on their website, it's, it's crazy, right? You see, if you go to Wikipedia, you can just go Wikipedia, General Education Board, scroll down to history or philosophy. Anyway, here we go with the first couple of sentences. In our dream, we have limitless resources and the people yield themselves with perfect docility to our molding hand. The present educational conventions fade from their minds and unhampered by tradition, we work our own good will upon a grateful and responsive rural folk. That is the root of the current education system that is pervasive around the world. And that is why I believe that if we truly want to starve the beast and move away from this oppression, we have to stop feeding them our kids' hearts, minds, and souls from the age of three, four, or five, because once they go in, you know, who is it that said, uh, show me, uh, give me a boy until the age of seven and I'll show you the man. This is what's going on. And yes, we have the money now, we have freedom money, but we, we're never gonna break free if our kids keep getting sent into these places, these, these indoctrination gulags is the only way you could actually describe them because this is what's going on. and. You know, my heart goes out as well to the teachers that are trapped in this system. This, you know, I'm not rallying against the teachers. I, I, I ask all of the teachers to go and read John Taylor Gatto's work. He was a state school teacher for 30 years. He's got three amazing books. And you will realize, and it's a very dark realization, that once you realize what you're actually a part of, um, you can escape. You can get out of it. There is still time. And, you know, really give back to society because people that are born to teach uh, you know, you, you've you've been you've been robbed of that that um, that life's you know goal of yours because you, the only place that you can do that that you're tricked into believing you can do that are in these institutions that are not there to purely educate people. They're there to indoctrinate people and, and churn out. You know, it's called standardized testing for a reason. You know, they're not even hiding it and. Anyway, that's a long rant, and um, hopefully, no, not um, at all. It's not a that, long rant at all. That was incredibly insightful, um, and it, you know, it you go through the history of it, and, and it's interesting because that era, you can make the argument that the Napoleonic era was basically the beginning of the modern nation state, and uh, it's interesting how, and I didn't know that by the way, how you know this was a reaction to what was happening in Europe at the time. Um, and it almost feels like, you know, and this is where I, I kind of want to focus on the second part where that model, this, the nation state model, right? If you read the book, the sovereign individual, which I've read so many times, highly recommend every Bitcoiner to read it. Um, we're, co we're coming out of that era due to the internet. I think the internet has empowered the everyday individual, not only to do their own research, 
right? But also to make content like we're doing right now, right? Without having to go through an intermediary, without having to go through a gatekeeper, right? And I think uh, a lot of the governments are freaking out because of this. They're coming up with terms like misinformation and stuff like that if it's not an approved narrative and all that. So we are heading into this new era. And because it's a new era, uh, because the internet is so powerful, because you can literally find anything that you want, especially if you do research the, the proper way, um, in a way, do do is is the legacy schooling necessary, or could you homeschool? Is is homeschooling an option in this day and age? I think it's essential. Like I said, uh, I, I think the only way that we move forward is to um, to take more control over our families. And uh, one thing that a lot of homeschooling parents face is pushback from people you know that you, you're cast aside you 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 know you're you're labeled irresponsible parents which uh is a complete misnomer because now you have nothing but pure responsibility for the education of your child you know like you're not outsourcing that to the state anymore and you can't hide behind the excuses of oh they must just have a bad teacher this year and you know it's um and we've all made those mistakes and we've all made those um, excuses as well and it, it's just it's, it's high time that, well, again, if you look at a timeline of human like history, like the, the way that we have been educating, like this, this experiment of mass compulsory education is a dot, is a, it like it's a complete dot on like the last hundred years or so. Um, and it's failed. Like he's, he's not fit for purpose, certainly not today. And yes, as for the internet, um, I'm sure you feel it as well. Uh, I think we're, we're moving into a very critical moment of, you know, what, what are they going to do? The people that are losing the control, um, over the narrative, I mean, they still have it, obviously they own all of the news outlets and newspapers and, you know, it's called social media, but we all know you can be deplatformed very, very quickly. And the next worry for us as a community is when are they going to bring in this idea of digital identity to even open a web page? You know, this is absolutely critical that we do not let this happen. And we, I, I think that's going to be a battle that's going to be fought over the next handful of years, uh, because, like you said. We can connect now all over the world at the touch of a button in really high definition as if you're sitting in the same room with people and have open discussions and talk about the most incredible things and ideas and philosophies and, you know, whatever. That's not good for those that want to just keep you know tight control over their nation and their people and just have good little tax slave worker bees uh you know the lockdowns look what happened during the lockdowns um the one of the great effects of that was that these mediums got better and we could all st and we all got much more used to you know doing these zoom calls you know nobody even says skype anymore but people were doing that uh there were a few apps there was that house party app do you remember that like that came and went but it just showed you the the, the creativity of people and the need for people to be able to connect. And if they couldn't do it in the bars the restaurants and the cafes and the pubs, um, then they were sure as hell going to do it online over the internet because you cannot stop us socializing. We are social creatures and we love to share ideas and you cannot kill an idea. Uh, so I don't know. I, I It's so powerful. I would love to see us use it more in that manner rather than getting trapped into the little you know funnels that they want us to fall into like scrolling your facebook timeline or your tiktok or your instagram or whatever that's just a waste of time except for bitcoin twitter of course nico right i mean <laughs> bitcoin <laughs> twitter is is such a great people don't realize it but it, it's essentially a news aggregator and um, it's incredibly powerful because it does a lot of the research for you if you're following the right people and if you tailor your feed in such a way. Um, it is an incredibly powerful tool uh, to, to especially to get news. 
And but again, you need a little bit of 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 your you need to do a little bit of thinking yourself. Right. It's it's not just a matter of reading a headline. It's kind of like you have to dig through the comments, see, and then you kind of get a consensus. You kind of get an idea, a general picture of what is actually going on. There's so many bright minds, uh, especially on 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 the side of Bitcoin. So I, I, I kind of want to go back to and we are getting to the top of the hour and I want to be respectful of your time. Uh, I I want to focus on the idea of homeschooling. So I, I'm a new father, right? So mm -hmm. uh, when I was in Portugal, literally my baby girl was like two or three months old, uh, my first one. So, you know, and I've been having this conversation with my wife about homeschooling, right? And she's more into it too, especially we're seeing what everything's going on with, you know, the, the quote unquote state schools. What are some practical steps, uh, you know, that people can take to start? Like you were mm -hmm. mentioning some books earlier, uh, you know, what, what would you recommend for new parents like myself that are looking into the homeschooling option? Yeah, I, I would, for the new parents, I, I would love for you guys to pick up John Holt's books. That's H-O-L-T. He was very much considered like the uh, the founding father of this kind of movement in the U.S. Uh, back in the 50s and 60s when, when he was a school teacher. Uh, and this is the interesting thing. Like the, it's the school teachers that are in the system that then step out of this system and then start pushing home ed or alternative ed, whatever. You're like, you know, they're the really interesting cases. Like, what did you see inside there that made you suddenly make a U-turn and be so passionate that you're going to write a book and dedicate the rest of your life to traveling around as Taylor Gatto did? Uh, he dedicated the rest of his life. He never said no to a speaking engagement. He flew all over the world to beat the drum and push this message as much as possible. And he wrote three books. But John Holt, for you young parents with young families, He's got a book called uh, How Children Learn. And it's a really beautiful book about, um, you know, like how young kids learn and how they're always learning. And then, you know, define learning, right? I mean, you, you, you can't because they're learning every single second of every single day in many different ways. Uh, and it's not just the idea of, well, they've got to be sat down at a desk by the age of five doing low-grade low clerical work, you know, for five days a week, seven hours a day. That That's lunacy. That's complete lunacy. Locking kids up in a classroom uh, with 29 other strangers is, it, I mean, when you really dig down into it, it's nigh on child abuse. Um, and especially the way that the system is now using these uh, opportunities to, to push through pharmaceutical products to alter people's behavior as well. I mean, that's just so damn wrong. Um, but yeah, I would say get hold of John Holt's work You'll even find some really old YouTube videos of, of John Holt. I think it was on the Phil Donahue show back in the 70s or 80s. And if you if you watch that 30, 45 minutes, whatever it is, back and forth, uh, John's sitting there with a homeschooled family and uh, facing down questions from not just uh, the host, but from triggered audience members. And we're still arguing that over the same points today. It's the same points. It's like, you know, Bitcoin boils the oceans, you know, like uh, of the homeschool world, uh, your kids are never going to be able to socialize. It's the the, 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 the um, analogous FUD. Uh, so if you've got kids a little bit older, anywhere between five and 10, I would recommend you read uh, the work of Naomi Fisher, uh, F-I-S-H-E-R, uh, she's got two books. Uh, the first one is Changing Our Minds. And she came from within the system herself. She worked within the NHS in the UK and was tasked with diagnosing kids with ADHD. And um, that was her job as a clinical child psychologist. But she had a two year long waiting list. And then she suddenly woke up one day like, what the, like, this can't be right. What if it's the system that's wrong and not the kids? And that was the light bulb moment for her. And she had to get out. She U-turned and she now spends every second of every day, you know, vehemently pushing back against um, the, the national curriculum, the state agendas, I like to call them, not curriculum. And, um, you know, what's going on inside of our state institutions. Uh, and then if you if you've got teenage kids, 
Uh, there's a Teenage Liberation Handbook, which is uh, very well known. Some, that name, it's, it's a good name. Yep. And uh, <laughs> that that's one for the kids themselves to read because sometimes, uh, you know, they're, yeah, that there's there's so much there's so much dark stuff that if you as a parent have any inkling at all that your ten to sixteen year old kid is suffering in any way, shape, or form at school, please get on top of it. Please, please pick up a book. Naomi Fisher, like I said, um, hold on to your kids by Gabor Mate is an absolute. A belter of a book and i've got a podcast episode i did with seb bunny about this and in seb's book uh, the hidden cost of money he's got a few chapters dedicated to education and uh, the breakdown of the family um which is all linked of course to the the money uh, and how that's been affected um been affecting families but the state is in your the state is in your kid's bedroom every single night when they're doing homework and that is also by design um, and then John Taylor Gatto's book, if you want to get up to speed and uh, understand all of the history that we were talking about earlier and the way that this come to be and the characters that set this up and the reasons why, uh, yeah, the underground history of the American education system, if you can find a copy, that should be a red flag for you <laughs> to find one right, right away. Uh, that's huge, though. Um, that's a big book. His other one is uh, Weapons of Mass Instruction or dumbing us down and they are very approachable and can be found on audible i believe so you can listen to that whilst you're driving around and yet yeah, they're the practical measures but as far as like you know where do i get a curriculum and uh, how do i do it do i have to it's like no forget all of that like that is just falling into that's your own uh processing programming talking uh, and for the diehard austrians out there you might not have realized that murray rothbard wrote a book about the education system it's called education free and compulsory and he does what rothbard does he just absolutely destroys it and then there's another book called um de-schooling society by ivan illich which is an absolute must read because you as a parent uh you, you can't just dive into this thing head first you're going to have to do your own research obviously this is why you're listening to this and, and the book suggestions um, but you have to deprogram yourself. Um, watch yourself closely. Watch when you get triggered. When you're reading some of these books, or if you've been triggered throughout this um, podcast for whatever reason, you know, when Nico and I have challenged the education system, you're being triggered because something deep inside of you is doing that. And uh, that's the programming that you are running. And it's essential to stop running. And like you said, again, operating system, right? If you can just click download, force quit, and get rid of that programming, you'll be able to move forward with a much clearer mind. And uh, it's going to be way better for you personally, mentally. Relationships with your family will grow in ways that you could never have imagined because as long as they're trapped up in that system, uh, that, you know, they are, they're being brought up by the state. They're not being brought up by you or your family values or your, um, you know, wider circle of family. Uh, and we really need to get back to that. And this idea of you know, Bitcoin citadels and homesteading and all of that, Nico, I love. You know, we want to get reconnected with nature. We want to get reconnected with our food sources. And our, uh, we want to drink, you know, the cleanest water we can find. People are reverse osmosis and uh, distilling water and all of that. But we definitely need to get back to rebuilding the family unit and have a bunch of kids, you know, absolutely loads of them. Uh, we were lucky. We got twins. So we went, we... we <laughs> I, I joke with my wife. I I got to have st I've had sex three times and I've got four kids. So, <laughs> oh man, that's that's hilarious, Daniel so, Prince. That, that, yeah. Thank you so much. Dropping the fire like always, guys. Check out the Once Bitten podcast, uh, Daniel. Thank you so much for coming on. Simply Bitcoin IRL. Really, really uh, pleasure, and it's an honor to have you on the show. And uh, guys, go check out all those books. Homeschooling for the win. Uh, we got to make more Bitcoin babies. This is how we win. Make more Bitcoin content. Make more Bitcoin podcasts, Daniel. Like I said, it's been an honor. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us on, man. Appreciate it. All right, guys, we'll be back for the Thursday live show, Simply Bitcoin, uh, live at 12.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. See you guys all. 
episode was brought to you by BitcoinWell.com, a Bitcoin-only platform on a mission to enable financial independence.